Hello there, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 67. We'll talk about how shoots and ladders is kind of like our pandemic, uh, some mask mandate information, vaccine FAQs, and some lessons from influenza. So when I was a kid, uh, we used to play shoots and ladders, and uh, I think there's a lot of things that are kind of like uh, uh, our current situation where, you know, uh, we could get lucky and the vaccine could get us like this ladder all the way from 80 to 100 and herd humanity, we could be done. Unfortunately, some other competing things could be like hitting this shoot here and going all the way back here, not necessarily to step one, but quite a ways back. Uh, the, the difference, though, is, of course, is that with shoots and ladders, it's just a random roll of dice. There's actually zero strategy. It's just dumb luck. Uh, however, with crummy coronavirus, or with coronavirus, we can make the right decisions. We can do things that uh, get us up there, like the vaccine, or we can do things to avoid infections and the variants to avoid going down that chute. And that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, so on the vaccine side, some great news. The rollout's getting better, uh, not only uh, in Nebraska, but across the country. But Nebraska's catching up, actually. So that's really good news. Um, you'll see that uh, we're over 2 million vaccines a day, which is also very, very uh, good. Uh, last a couple of weeks, I talked about and more optimistic scenario where if we can increase our supply, we could get to herd humanity potentially as early as this summer, May through July kind of range. And so we are making advances toward potentially getting there, which could be great news. Um, the downside, though, is that here locally and across the state, the numbers look almost identical, actually, is that we're no longer dropping cases. We're actually plateauing. We've plateaued for a solid month now. Uh, no, not much better than we were last summer heading into the fall, unfortunately. So we're sort of at a sort of an impasse, tug of war, not quite making the difference. And so I think you have two offsetting things. One, we are making progress. The vaccine's getting closer to herd humidity. On the flip side, though, uh, basically, we are uh, not dropping R. We're, we're basically staying here. We're not doing this. And the thing, reason that we're probably not, uh, one is that the variants are here in Nebraska. So last week, uh, the Health Alert Network uh, basically pushed out that we do have uh, both the UK variants and the Cal California variants are already here. Uh, so far, not the Brazil or South Africa variants, thankfully. But we already have these in Nebraska, and these are more infectious, and this could be a problem. Added to that, people are letting their mask ordinances expire. Uh, here, in Nebraska, here in Lincoln, we've got the Pinnacle Bank Arena uh, tournaments, and if you look closely at this crowd, you'll see uh, probably more than half are either nose commandos or chin diapers, screaming, yelling fans. Uh, that's kind of an infection risk, so uh, this is uh, really makes me worried, and this is what it was in the paper this morning. Uh, so you know, to kind of watch this, uh, thankfully, I think uh, the UNL, like I've talked about before, they're, they're, uh, they have probably what I would say is the best screening and surveillance system in the state right now. Uh, their infection rates, thankfully, are very low, so, and it's, they've stayed low at least, so at least we're not having any lost ground here. And I think it's a really important because this is our best comparison to what happened in Manaus, Brazil. We had about six, uh, seven, six months ago or so, they had their big outbreak, kind of like uh, in Manaus, so I used this article previously. Uh, where they basically had a big outrage, thought they got to herd humanity, and about six, seven months later, uh-oh, it took off again when their variant hit. So, by watching UNL, they can be our canary in the coal mine. So every morning, this is one of the first things I click on, is to make sure this stays where it is. Hopefully that means we can get to herd humanity without having a bright, uh, total fallback like Manaus. Uh, other things is the mask mandates, and so Omaha and Lincoln, or Omaha metro area and Lincoln Lancaster County have extended their mask mandates, which is a good thing. Others have not. Uh, CDC released this study, and it's rock solid that yes, mask mandates really do slow down both case rates and death rates. Uh, it's statistically significant, and was within 20 days actually. On the flip side. Uh, prematurely letting opening up the restaurants to too much capacity did the opposite. You had an increased growth rate and increased death rates. Uh, I've seen a lot of people misquote this study because they're looking at this 2% and thinking it's an absolute risk, which is not exactly what this is saying. Uh, so the way I explain it, it's the difference between a 2% APR on your mortgage versus a 2% daily compounding loan shark loan. One of them's a good deal. This one will bankrupt you. They're both 2%, but they're not saying what the, some of the folks out there are trying to say about this article. It's pretty clear that these do make a difference. Uh, another example I use, I shared this at the city council on Monday, uh, basically thanking them for their leadership. Uh, because if you look at this, our mortality rate, Lancaster County versus other places, uh, Omaha metro area, the rest of Nebraska, uh, Iowa, South Dakota, our mortality rate was far lower. Uh, in the range of 100 to 450 fewer deaths than if we'd have followed these paths. So I thank our city council uh, for their leadership because uh, this has actually literally saved the lives of hundreds of Lincolnites. Um, in addition to this, we've also 
also save money on health care. So in my day job, uh, we get uh, uh, reports from Medicare and our Medicare population showing the costs of coronavirus care for our patients versus the rest of the state, the country, and our, actually our costs are much lower. And so not only did we save lives, we lowered health care costs for our contract, $3 million actually. And if you extrapolate those savings to the other networks in town and the other insurance plans, that means Lincoln saved millions of tens of millions of dollars of health care costs in addition to saving lives. And they did this while also maintaining a 3% unemployment rate uh, and having our schools open. And so I think we made the right balance in Lincoln on multiple metrics. So uh, congratulations to our mayor, city council, and health department for really striking the right balance, I think. Uh, a way to look at this, I think uh, one of my favorite uh, folks is Colin Powell. Uh, he has a great uh, things on leadership, and one of the things I like is his 40 to 70 rule. And what he says is a leader needs to get at least 40% of the information before making a decision. And I think the biggest mistake made in the United States is people went down to Barrington, uh, let it run, uh, heard natural herd immunity path without enough information. It was a shoot from the hip decision and resulted in the deaths of over half a million Americans. On the flip side, we had people in some large cities that waited too long to open their schools when, at, when we already had enough data to say that you could open schools safely. So we had people making mistakes on both sides of this, uh, of this uh, equation. And it's really, it's difficult to make a decision without all the information, but you also to make sure you do your diligence to get enough information. And I think we stroke the right balance there here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, other new things, so the CDC guidelines for the vaccinated came out, and I think these are very helpful. Uh, so those, those of us who have been vaccinated, my wife and I are physicians, we do, we have now started getting together with our other uh, relatives, like for example, my father-in-law who's been vaccinated. Also, you can get together with a single household of a low risk person. So we got together with one of my college buddies over the weekend for dinner uh, because we've both been vaccinated. And so those smaller gatherings are safe, even if not 100% are vaccinated. However, not okay with, okay with multifamily uh, non-vaccinated groups though. Uh, the one thing I would disagree with is this discouraging non-essential travel. Ali Khan also uh, had a tweet this weekend, and I, I agree with him. Uh, I think we can do travel safely if we do two out of three things. If we have been vaccinated, if we have a mask, or we have a negative test. If you've got two of these three things, I think it's perfectly fi fine to go flying around. You just got to have two of the three. Um, and so I, th I wish they would open this up a little bit because I think uh, the economy could use this. Uh, uh, vaccine safety and so there was a really good uh, uh, webinar yesterday and I've linked to it in the notes section so you can listen to this yourself uh, we've had 60 70 million doses already and lots of people to study on top of that uh, when you give that, that many vaccine lo and behold some of those people end up being pregnant and now we have over 30,000 pregnant women that they are following who has received the vaccine and this gives us some very good uh, safety information so that women who are pregnant can make a better decision uh, most uh, OBGYNs I know are saying that the benefits of the vaccine out do outweigh the risks and to go ahead, they are following those 30,000 women. And they're comparing them, uh, basically the out, uh, background rates of various things versus whether you had a vaccine and seeing is there any difference? And the good news is there isn't a statistically significant difference. Important thing to point out is miscarriage. Yes, there are women who have had the vaccine who have a miscarriage. However, there's lots of women who haven't had that vaccine and have a miscarriage. And the baseline risk for miscarriages is actually real higher than most people think. It's 26%. You don't hear about that because nobody advertises the fact that they have a miscarriage, but it's more common than people realize. And so right now the comparative data is looking really good. And this is over 30,000 women. And those numbers will get higher and higher as far as the number of women involved so we can really assure that this is safe. Uh, other things they talked about again is, uh, is the confidence in getting vaccine and making sure that we can convince people who are sort of on the fence. Uh, and so uh, one, drawing from the people people trust most. So having your doctors and nurses convey that message are the most effective messengers. So we need to keep using those as our most effective messengers. Um, the good news is over time we're making improvements pretty much across the board in the people who are quote vaccine hesitant. Uh, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is and the same for the state, we are seeing unfortunately very big disparities in both the Hispanic population and the black population and not getting vaccinated at the same rates. So this is a big disparity that I think we really, really need to start focusing on the next month or two to fix this because uh, this is just wrong for our community. Um, I think this was a really good article from uh, Dr. Ree Boyd, a pediatrician, about the act, the hesitancy may be a little mislabeled and a little bit of blaming the victim, uh, that it turns out that black people actually do get vaccinated as much as white people as long as it's their health care provider offering it to them. And so partly it's a messaging problem, not as much necessarily uh, an increased suspicion, mainly because it's maybe the wrong messenger in the wrong place. Um, 
Again, uh, this from the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, basically saying that basically where do people trust getting vaccinated? Their own doctor's office. And unfortunately, that is still the one place you can't get the vaccine. And so I think if we fix this in the next few weeks and make sure that the doctor's offices that take care of the black population, they need to be prioritized to get the vaccine because they're going to be the best at getting uh, both the Hispanic and, and black population vaccinated to remove some of these disparities. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation actually has really good data on all kinds of demographic groups. The good news is the trends just keep getting better across the board, meaning more people going from the only if required or wait and see over to the I'll get it now as they get more data, more trust. Uh, the biggest difference though, though, unfortunately, is still along political lines. And so I think this is where something where we need our Republican leaders to start carrying the message more because uh, they'll be the ones most likely to, to uh, convince other fellow Republicans. And so I think this is where we probably need to make the biggest progress. Obviously, it's actually not just not necessarily the race and ethnicity, but really uh, along party lines is still the biggest problem, I think. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is actually influenza and what we might be able to learn from this. And so the interesting thing that has surprised people is how effective our campaign has been again about making an influenza season go away. It's almost going down to zero such that so far only one reported pediatric death compared to usually around 200 uh, many seasons. And so we've literally made influenza season go away this year. We could make it go away in the future as well with what we've learned. If we have high vaccination rates for influenza plus masking when you're sick, we could actually make this go away in the future. Uh, and so this is something we need to think about. So not only could we make coronavirus vax, uh, epidemics go away, we could learn enough to make, make influenza uh, epidemics go away. Um, so some things about the Johnson & Johnson back, uh, shot we talked about last week. Uh, again, this is not necessarily comparable, this middle column. The 66% here uh, this was, uh, uh, I guess, what you might say studied against the A-team. When these studies were done for Johnson & Johnson, it was against the variants, which may, uh, so Influ Mar Pfizer and Moderna might not have done it well as well at this time. The other thing, this is only the, the one-dose vaccine trial. There actually is a second arm of the Johnson Johnson that's two doses, so it may be that you actually do need a, a second booster for the Johnson Johnson as well. We'll find that out as this trial completes itself. Uh, also, I think it's highly likely we're going to need an annual booster like influenza, so it would not be surprising me that if everybody might be getting a booster shot this fall, for example. But again, the, the, the dead not dead metric is equally effective for both and the reduction of spread that comes from the Johnson Johnson also has really good data. So there's still the we discussion of a vaccine. So go ahead and get that Johnson Johnson vaccine as soon as it's given to you. Uh, but it could be that we actually even have an influenza coronavirus booster given together this fall. Wouldn't that be uh, convenient and more effective? Uh, someone asked me, well, can you do that? And the answer is, well, yeah, we already do that. We've uh, been giving MMRs and MMRVs for a long time now, and that's mumps, measles, rubella, and potentially varicella. We actually do all four now. Uh, was one of the combinations. Of course, that's chicken pox. We do the same thing in adults constantly for Tdap. So they added, used to be you just got the TD of the tetanus and diphtheria until they found out that some adults were spreading pertussis to infants. And so now most young adults are also given a pertussis booster for the same kinds of reason. You lose immunity over time to, to, to multiple. That's why you have to get boosters every five to 10 years, for example. And, I, and 15 years ago, I did see an infant in the emergency room with pertussis and probably gotten uh, from an older adult, for example. That's why we do Tdaps now. And it's why it's a required vaccine, even in, uh, in adolescence, for example. Um, also, keep in mind that we've made all, a lot of these things go away in the past, and so I've used this history. This is my own family history. My great-great-grandparents, who unfortunately lost three of their six children, what used to be the norm before we had clean water, sanitation, and vaccines. We made diphtheria go away complete with vaccines. We made typhoid go away, not with vaccines, but actually just clean water and, and wash in your hands. And so if you go to a country that doesn't have, is not a developed country, sometimes you have to get a typhoid vaccine now, but you can make these things permanently go away with combinations of public health measures and vaccines. So it is possible that we could make coronavirus and influenza uh, so low, but with that continued vaccination that we don't have deaths from those anymore. So we can learn from the history and keep doing the right things. And we need to kind of remember this history that we used to have in the past. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, we can keep Nebraska deaths below 3,000. I'm pretty hopeful we'll get there. I just hope we can get herd humidity before the variants break out again. Uh, so wear a mask around anyone who doesn't live in your house uh, unless you've been fully vaccinated, and then that changes things, of course. Avoid the crowded, confined spaces. Keep your distance and get your vaccine when your number is called. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, this is where I work. Uh, however, usual disclaimer, these are my opinions, not necessarily everybody here, uh, and hope this helps.